Welcome back to Soul Back. This is the R&B Podcast. Kyle here back with Ed. Ed, where's Tom? You know, Tom picked a funny day to disappear and do daddy duties because I can confirm, y'all, Tom has not been kidnapped by Tank. He's still alive. He's just out doing his thing. (laughs) Well, Ed, before we get into that, and I know we have a lot to say about that topic... Um, uh, yes, we today do. is my birthday. So yes, happy birthday to my boy. Yes, thank I wish you, you all you. the Ashanti albums and Mario singles that you can find, at least for today. Tomorrow, then I'll be back to crapping on your favorites, as I am known to do. <laughs> well, shout out to our boy Daniel Bamber. He sh- he gave me a birthday greet and wrote something along the lines of, "Kyle, you're turning thirty. You're getting a little too old to be liking Mario. It's time to get into some D'Angelo. Is that what happens when you turn 30, Ed? (laughs) Yes, player. This is what happens. Soon your playlist will be nothing but D'Angelo and Maxwell. And if you're feeling frisky, maybe a little bit of Leela James up in there. But come over to the side of the middle age. You will soon join us. Wow. (laughs) Well, uh, being that it's my birthday... And um, this is a shameless plug, but Denny's, they actually offer a free breakfast on your birthday. So, Ed, to be a little health conscious, being in my 30s now, the metabolism doesn't work like it used to. I might have to go with turkey bacon versus regular bacon. What are your thoughts on turkey bacon? You know, I don't hate turkey bacon. It's, well, depending on what kind you get, it can be a little rubbery. It can kind of be like eating the bumper of a car if you've gotten the wrong kind. But, you know, if you have to have bacon... I'm not mad at the turkey. Now, I eat it so rarely anyway that I'm like, look, I'm just going to dive in with the pork. But I'm not mad at the turkey bacon. These are lessons that you learn when your metabolism is as slow as an R&B release in 2020. Because, player, <laughs> no matter what you eat, it will stick to your ribs. And you'll be like, what? Kind of sucks. Well, it's better than Tom. All he eats is yogurt and oatmeal. So I might have to oh, get to God. that soon. That bland guy. Uh, I'm sure he's somewhere now grilling some chicken and not putting not a speck of seasoning on it. <laughs> yeah. But, Ed, we have a lot to talk about in R&B this week. But yeah. we have to, I guess, start off. And this might be the last time we ever mention this guy's name on the podcast <laughs> as per as per his request. But remember last week when um, Tank went on record saying he was going back to the basics and... He was bringing the old tank back. You know, we had our reservations and our feelings to it. We posted that clip on our social media. Tank being Tank saw the podcast, listened to it, gave his two cents. And Eddie wasn't very happy about what we had to say. Tank was not very happy. And I will I will save my comments for a second. But I don't know. I feel like that number one... If you look at the feedback that we got from a lot of our listeners, they thought we were very fair and either agreed or like agreed to disagree. But I just did not like his response as far as maturity goes. But before I go on my rant, I'll let you weigh in. Well, I mean, what Tank pretty much just said was that, you know, we have the right to not like his music, but... We shouldn't be trashing it. At the end of the day, it is his art. Um, don't don't um, assassinate his character or question his motives. He's just doing it for you know his career. This is this is his career. He wants to take control of it. So we either like it or we don't. And you know what? I can't say that I disagree with that. Uh, this is no apology to Tank because. Obviously, we feel the way that we feel about his music right now. So it is what it is. But I guess, Ed, it just leads to a bigger question. Should we even be criticizing or critiquing an artist's music? I mean, you're a reviewer, so it's your job to do so. But are they really listening? I don't think so. And I think that the biggest problem with 2020, 2019, and 2018 is this whole perception of what the word hating is. So let me go on my rant right quick. You know me, player. So sit back, go on and get some lunch. If Tom was here, I'd tell him to go grill, throw some chicken on the grill, because I'm going to take my time with this one. 
because we allowed Tank to have his say, which he did, and I appreciate, and we respect, by the way. However, I do think there are some things that need to be addressed, just keeping it on the real. So, again, this is just me talking, by the way. This is Edward T. Bowser of Soul and Stereo talking, by the way. So, if you got beef, tweet E.T. Bowser. If you got IG and Facebook, it's Edward Bowser. I got the same blue check as Tank, so I ain't that hard to find. Remember, this is me. So, keep that in mind. But anyway, you were talking earlier about, like, hating and criticism and all that stuff. And I think the problem for me, player, is that hating has kind of become this word that you just use when you disagree with somebody's opinion. And to me, that's why. Like, if I say, Kyle, I don't like I don't like you, Kyle, because I don't like the color of your shirt. That's hating because it's baseless. Like, there's no claim to it. But if I make a legit claim against you... That's constructive criticism, or at least an opinion. So let me take my time, as the pastors say in the church, before I take my seat to address Mr. Durrell, a.k.a. Tank. So like I said many times, like, I'm a trained journalist and an editorial writer, and like you said, I'm a reviewer. So that means a brother gets paid for informed opinion writing. And let me educate you on what that is. Informed opinion writing means presenting all the available facts and then laying them out. And then making a statement. So remember to go back to the crux of like all this tank foolishness. My point last week, which it seems like everybody has forgotten about. But my point last week originally was that I took issue with him throwing stones at Kay Michelle when she suggested that the industry should bring soul back to R&B. And your boy kind of made it an old generation versus new generation thing, which was not her intent. Then three or four weeks later, he talked about how he's bringing soul back conspicuous, suspiciously, I should say, after that P.J. Morton tweet went viral. Keep in mind, this is the same brother who came on your very website, Kyle, and said, and remind me unless I am misquoting, something like, I'm doing trap now. If you want the old tank, go buy the old tank albums. That's kind of what he told us. And rightfully, I called him out. Because that was trash. Not because of his music at that point. The, hypo- the hypocrisy and going at K. Michelle, I thought was disrespectful. I stand by that. What I just said right there, as you just proved, that was all facts. I used those facts to make an informed opinion. Brother, I ain't tell not one lie in that statement. So, whereas you have the right to disagree with someone, just like I got the right to disagree with Tank Flip Flopping, or how his trap stuff, other than that one hit, has been met with critical and commercial displeasure. Again, that's facts. You can look at the charts. That's whatever. But what I really don't like, just keeping it real, on the podcast, is Tank going off on you or Tom instead of directing comments to me. And I'm not not challenging Tank. I'm not restarting beef. This thing is over. It's squashed. But for everybody listening out there, don't come at my little brothers, Tom and Kyle, for what Big Brother said. I know you know I got so posted the audio, but if you listen to the full podcast, the full podcast, you will see we made informed opinions. So check those out without flying off the handle. And remember, Tom, he was up in the cut every other second was talking about sex, love and pain too. sex, love and pain too. Remember, that was great. Tom kept it real because that's what he liked. Tom was continually in Tank's corner. So, you know, I got soul continued to show love even in its criticism. So, like you said earlier, I'm not going to kiss up. I'm not going to apologize. I'm not going to say any of that because there's nothing to apologize for. Everything I said was receipts. And if you don't, if you need some more receipts, go right now to soulandstereo.com. Like put it in your little browser. Click the menu tab. Click on album rankings, scroll down to the T's, and you'll see Tank. If you click that post, you will see my opinion on every single album that brother dropped. Every single album. And you'll see, as we have done, lots of love for his better albums. And then I give you some honest assessment about the not-so-great albums. And we do that because we're honest. The whole reason we have this podcast is because the name of it is Soul Back. And we working. To bring soul back. And I appreciate again all the fans who either of you know I got soul, soul and stereo, soul back, the cipher, Facebook, Twitter. 
I don't know about y'all, but 99% of the response I've seen throughout all this tank foolishness has been very positive. Everybody was like, thank you for speaking up. Tank is wilding out. Y'all weren't being disrespectful. You were telling the truth. Even my girl from Cassandra from Soul and Serial Cypher. Shout out to Cassandra. She's a huge tank stan. She was like, you know, I like the new tank stuff. I don't necessarily agree with you not liking it, but I respect your opinion and you weren't disrespectful. So, again, we're not flexing. We're not trying to go off on tank. And, again, if we are making a factual error, we're going to make clarifications. But other than that, we're going to tell our opinions because that's why you listen to this podcast. And I don't want tank coming for tank Michelle. For, uh, tank Michelle. Tank coming for K. Michelle, flip-flopping around, dissing Tom, dissing Kyle, dissing the podcast, or even dissing fans who disagree with them. It's not mature and it's not fair. We stand here as voices for R&B fans. So that's what we're going to do. And again, if you want to holler at me, it's E.T. Bowser on Twitter, not Y-K-I-G-S on Twitter. Come see about me. Well, now I just fear that Tank's going to reply back to us again and call out Y-K-I-G-S. But <laughs> um, <laughs> Basically. But, uh, I mean, I agree with everything you're saying. And I don't really feel like we did anything wrong, per se. Um, I mean, I give us the benefit of the doubt and props because we're actually listening to every single Tank album. It would be different yes. if it came out, we didn't even bother to listen to it, we based it off of one single, we called it trash and moved on. We're not doing that. We're fair, I would like to believe. But again, Ed, as this was all going down, I started really reflecting, right? Just based off mm -hmm. the last decade of R&B. Because Tank is not the first artist we've criticized. He probably won't be the last. But if you look at R&B, again, I don't know if anyone wants to listen to our opinion. I think for a lot of artists, they just want their fans to, lis to listen and like whatever they put out. I don't know if that's healthy for the genre. But, you know, at some point throughout all this, I just looked back and said, you know what, I'm discouraged, I'm tired of really voicing my opinion on this. No one's listening. Let's just let the artist create. And my girl, Lachelle, said it best. If something comes out and it's good, great. If it doesn't, well, no, no love lost. We'll move on because these artists, including Tank, they've brought us so many great memories, so much great music over the last two decades. If he wants to go ahead and do what he wants to do, we should just let him do that. But... He also has to understand there's going to be some point when his fans feel alienated. And hopefully by that point, he comes back to the stuff that we like. But, you know, there's a risk with that, knowing that we might not be there anymore. So, I don't know. It's a lot of thoughts. I don't want to really go on in this discussion for too much longer because it is what it is. But, man, yeah. um, it, it is, you know, it, it, it's a very complex situation. I understand from an artist standpoint they're very sensitive about their art, their creation. And on top of that, this is how they, you know, provide an income for their family. So definitely don't want to take money out of their pockets. But, you know, as a diehard fan, which I think you and I both are, as well as a lot of these people listening to this podcast, we're so passionate about the genre. We just want to see it succeed. And for people that grew up in our era and maybe beforehand, we know what the quality was. So it comes to a certain point where you just can't accept anything less than good. Well, I, and I'm with you. I don't want to bemoan this topic. I feel like I've talked about it all week long. I'm tired of it. And like you, I'm a little frustrated. But again, I wasn't frustrated because, ooh, Tank said stuff and he's mad at me. I was more frustrated for you and Tom because I felt like a lot of the heat was going to you and him when 90% of his beef was with me. And I get that, you know, y'all posted the audio and he knows you too. So that's why he would come for you. And that's why I said earlier, we make a joke about it here on the podcast about tweet me at E.T. Bowser, but it's for real. Like my opinions are my opinions. So come at me. But two things and then I'm going to let it go. One thing that kind of came up and that you mentioned about was like these guys, this is their art and we can't come for their art. I have a problem with that. And here's why. Because I am a writer and as a writer, I am a creator, too. Therefore, my words are my art. And the risk of sharing your art with the world means that everybody ain't going to like your art. I'm sorry. This is how the world works. Real talk. And I'm being very serious when I tell you this. As a writer, when I have written in the past about race, 
I've had people come from my family, like real life, not stupid Twitter trolls. I've had some, one time this dude sent me a letter, like drew this picture. It was so creepy and weird about how I needed to go back to Africa and dig some well water. I can't even remember the whole thing, but it's crazy. My point is, no matter what people do when they come at you, as a creator, you have to realize that you have to stand by your art. If I can handle like dudes sending me racist cartoons that they drew, I am not tripping over Tank throwing a tantrum on Twitter. I'm just being real. But the lesson here is whether it's a troll coming at you or an artist being crusty, you need to just stand by what you believe. And the thing that I have a problem with with some artists is that because of the social media era, it's kind of a blessing and a curse. Because before an artist could put out music, they're surrounded by their yes man. They're surrounded by diehard fans. They didn't hear the criticism like they hear it now. And to be fair, some of that criticism is stupid and unwarranted because anybody has a voice. However, when that criticism is coming from trusted sites, from you know, I got soul, soul and stereo, people who, like I said, have listened to every one of his albums, studied all of his work, considers themselves fans. When they're saying this, it's not just to throw stones to throw stones. We're saying it because we want you to be better. We want the genre to be better. And that's why I took so much great offense to the K. Michelle issue again, which of all this stuff, that was the one thing that was not brought up. And that was my main beef. Because K. Michelle was doing exactly what this podcast is doing. She was trying to bring soul back. Tank was trying to not bring soul back with his comment. Because he was like, y'all do what you want. She's just an old hater, old lady hating on a young artist. That's what he said. Then he flipped two or three weeks later. That was why I was upset initially. The Tank making trap stuff, I've been fussing about that forever. So that was irrelevant. What we're trying to do, Mr. Tank, is to use this platform to make you better because we know how great you can be. And we want every artist, I want every album I review to be five stars because it'd be the easiest job ever. I don't want to be doing all these whackness. So we're here to build it, uh, to build the genre up. That's it. It's not hate. You can take it as hate. You can mean your feelings. It's whatever. If you decide, Kyle, that as you know, I got soul. They will celebrate the good stuff, and when the bad stuff comes out, they just you just don't say anything. That's cool. That's what the road you're going to travel down. But me and Miles, I have a different audience. If something's great, I will tell you it's tremendous, whether you want to hear it or not. You know how much I hyped up that Bruno Mars album until you got sick of it. But if it's not good, I'm going to say it. And because I said it, come see me at E.T. Bowser. That's it. Well said, Ed. And like you said, if it's good, we'll be the first one to say it's good. If it's bad, I mean, I guess the new approach is we just won't talk about it. But, you know, we got a couple of releases here. (laughs) But, Ed, we do have a couple of releases that came out this week that uh, I do want to talk about. Uh, First one being Janae Aiko's Chalambo album. Funny enough, Janae actually has us blocked on Twitter because I think Tom diss one of her songs i think it was the maniac song so <laughs> oh my Janae god unblock here we us go again because, yeah but janae unblock us because i i don't know how you feel about it Ed, but i listened to this album for the last two days and i actually really enjoy it um it's not you know some of the stuff is a little too you know i don't want to say sleepy but maybe sleepy is the right word it, like when it's good it's really good um i think the um. problem is that it's like 20 songs and I think that's what there. hurts it. But some of those records, and I'll, you know, the one thing I'll say is the transition f- for some of those songs, it works really well. I think if she had just cut it down to about 13 or 14 songs, I think we're working with something here. Um, You said that you didn't want to say it was sleepy. It's funny she's got this song called, like, what is it, like, Born Tired or Always Tired? And the first words out of her mouth are, I'm sleeping. And I'm like, you <laughs> and me both, lady. Well, I mean, and I have, this has been a kind of, and we talked about this last week before everybody got sidetracked by Tank. Janae is a talented artist, but her music is just, and it has its fans over on the Soul and Serial Cypher on Facebook. Come check us out. Over there, there were a lot of people that were like, I really like this album. But to me, it was a little too sleepy in spots. This is one of her better albums. I will agree that overall, I'm not sure if it's her best. But it's definitely one of her best. 
And it's definitely better than the most previous album. But the shortcomings are, it is a little too ponderous, it's a little too slow, and a little too freeform. And our boy Daniel tweeted us a couple days ago, and she sent out a tweet that was basically like, all these songs are, I just freestyled all these songs, with the exception of the song that's kind of about smoking weed. And I'm like, that makes sense, because that's one of the better songs, because it sounds structured. It doesn't sound like she's just kind of just... You know, moaning off the top of her head, which a lot of this stuff does. If it's okay, if you're a fan of like that mood music, then you'll like it. But if you like more structured songwriting, more structured sequencing and things like that, it's okay, but don't operate it heavy machinery while listening to this thing. I'm just warning you. (laughs) No, I mean, I think that's the point. Um, And that's that's why I enjoy it so much is that moodiness. It kind of works well. Janae has a way... With her music, I mean, if you like that type of music, um, I think you'll be a fan. But a couple of songs I want to highlight here, Ed, that I felt really stood out. The first one, of course, being the Nas record, 10,000 Hours. That record right there, with the 90s hip-hop beat, that record works really well. That one was one of my favorites, if not the best one. And, of course, my boy Nas, always impeccable with the flow. Like, he just absolutely did a great job on that beat. Love that song. And, again, there are plenty of great songs here. You give it a trim, you cut out like maybe five or six of the fillers, you tighten it up a little bit, and this could have been something really special. Yeah, and I know a lot of people have really liked that Her collaboration. Uh, And then there's that record with Big Sean where he like creeps up in the end. I think we've talked about this earlier um, in another podcast, but Ed, his flow, what's going on there? Play him, please. Not, we just talked about Nas. Big Sean is the anti-Nas. I don't know what people hear in this dude. But good grief, like they catch the beat, catch the beat is all I'm asking. He is the spiritual son of Silk the Shocker. I'll give him that. <laughs> and then, of course, that Smoke song as well. So, Janae has a couple of um, records on here that I think are really dope. And uh, she's going on tour soon with Queen Nigel, so that will be exciting. And another record that I actually thought was really strong here, Sean Stockman. He dropped his new single, which... We have been waiting on a Sean Stockman album real, really for like 20 years now. But um, in terms of what we were expecting recently, probably over the last two years, he dropped the Sean EP. Was that two years ago? I think it was. But this All I Do record produced by Tim Kelly. Ed, this is what I want to hear from our veteran artists. This is what I want to hear. I mean, again, it doesn't sound like Boys and Men 1994. And I don't want it to sound like Boys and Men 1994. I wanted it to sound like Sean Stockman, but I wanted it to sound like 2020. And that's what this is. It fits him perfectly. The vocals are pristine. The writing is good. I love the beat. This is one of my favorite songs of the very early year so far, and I can't wait for this project. And I'm glad it's finally happening. At least it seems like it's finally happening. Do you think the hype's down, died down a little bit since it's taking so long? I think it has, but remember, this is the social media era. It can only take one tweet for something to hype up. But, but the point is, there is still a kind of a emphasis that the artist or the label or someone has to hype it up. I think in the Beyonce surprise album era, there's this mentality that, oh, I just got to drop an album and all of a sudden everybody will go nuts and blah, blah. Like, that's not going to happen for even, I don't even say that working with a Mariah Carey. And that's a once in a lifetime type deal. So if he puts in work, sure, he can get buzz around this pretty fast. And he definitely has the content there to make it work. I'm excited. Mm Mm-hmm. And then uh, Ro James dropped the record, too. I haven't heard it yet. Have you heard it, Touchy Feely? I have not heard this one. So we'll talk about it next week. Um, There is a record that I do want to talk about here. I don't know if you've heard it because Jacquees is featured on it. Um, Angelica Villa, the record Why? No, I I didn't hear about this one at all. Yeah, so she signed to Rock Nation. She's Fat Joe's artist. Um, features Jacquees on the record. It really sounds like a 90s type of vibe. So I really enjoyed that one. Um, she's one of those young rising acts that's trying to break through right now. So Ed, be on the lookout for her. Fat Joe says that she'll be the next one. I actually have heard of her, and I think I've heard some tracks before. I do remember her being Fat Joe's artist. So... If I'm remembering correctly, what I heard before actually was pretty all right. And again, I trust Fat Joe. We've talked, I think we've talked about him before here. Maybe it was another podcast I was on. 
But I feel like he's a little underrated as far as his contributions to kind of a hip hop game and his longevity. So if he co-signs an artist, most times I'm going to be like, okay, it's probably something there. So I'll check it out. Jacquees being on the record, we'll see, because you know he can be hit or miss. But I'll definitely check <laughs> this one out. Right. And then, Ed, some interesting and exciting news for you. Brandy is set to drop her new single at the end of the month. The record Baby Mama featuring everyone's favorite artist, but not Tom's, Chance the Rapper. I know Tom <laughs> feels some type of way, not only about Brandy collaborating with Young Axe, but also the fact that it is Chance the Rapper, who we have titled as the fake nice guy. Is that his name? Oh my God. Here comes Tom with that mess. I don't know if he's a fake nice guy or not. I do think it's part of his persona that... That kind of all shucks. I'm just happy to be here. I know that's part of like how he's branded, but that doesn't mean it's fake. It just could be that's how they're propping him up. I have, right. <laughs> I think I'm excited for this track. We shall see how it goes. I'm not, I'm not, I'm Tom. Tom will be like, oh, it's branded. She can only do songs with AZ. I'm like, dog, it's not 1995. She can do some stuff this current. It's okay. So as long as she's not doing something that's completely out of her lane, it'll be fine. And Chance, I like Chance. I did not like Chance's last album, but Chance has talent. So I think there's enough here that's intriguing. We shall see. Ed, being that it's Twitter and there's Brandy Stans running around posting things on there, I've seen a lot of tweets saying i can't wait for brandy to get back to the top hopefully this hits at least number 30 on the billboard 100 uh hopefully she goes on a huge tour gets huge promo music videos all of that as a fan of r&b in 2020 of these veterans are you really expecting Mm -hmm. all of that even from someone like brandy because i'm not i mean just to be fair i'm not and that's no slight to her we just have to look at the climate do i want it to happen sure but you just have to remember what the climate is. Even in the 90s, you didn't see when when R&B was like at this plateau. You didn't see artists from 20 years ago just hopping back on the charts like that. Like you would see a a um Barry White or Patti LaBelle or even or Luther kind of he's in his own lane. He was still getting number ones even back then. But these artists that kind of were big in the 70s when they came back in the 90s, they didn't always immediately rock it to the top. They did have more opportunity to get their stuff shown. You didn't have a bunch of haters talking about, oh, he's old and washed up. What's he doing here? Like you do with these bums today. But that's another rant for another day. All I want is quality music. I do not care what that thing charts. If I hear it and I'm like, man, this should be a number one, that's great. I don't expect it, but I'm selfish. I just want something hot. I don't really care about the charting. And there's that. Uh, A couple more records here. I haven't really actually listened to it yet, but I've seen people tweeting about it. Uh, Tamar Braxton dropped a new record that uh, samples uh, Saving My Love For You. Saving All My Love For You by Whitney. It's it's produced by Hitmaker. Yes, and I did not hear this, but I heard of it because I saw Twitter going off about it. You know those Tamarsons, boy. It doesn't take much to get them stirred up. So I saw that it was all the rage for a few minutes the other day. But I haven't heard this one yet either. Well, I'm reading a comment here. Someone said this needs to sit right beside the hologram tour. <laughs> I don't oh, know I don't if that's good or like bad. <laughs> um, yeah, isn't that hologram tour happening right now? It's apparently happening. I don't I don't know how I feel about this. Because it, essentially, you're going to pay to see to listen to audio that you've already heard while some weird old image kind of reenacts it it'd be like playing old cds in your house while you're watching like old youtube videos on mute and just having the cd do like the audio it's i guess there's an audience for it but i'm not the one it feels creepy (laughs) what about those like michael jackson tribute concerts where it's like an imposter Oh, that's even worse. Like, that's just, it's one thing to have a hologram. It's another to have somebody cosplaying running around and like, oh, I'm really Michael Jackson. Save that for karaoke night. (laughs) Or what about Sony putting Michael Jackson music 
uh, or putting out Michael Jackson music and you finding out it's not even Michael Jackson singing the songs. <laughs> even though we kind of already knew it anyway. We've been listening to this man for, what, like 40 years? I think we can know when somebody down the street is doing a Michael Jackson impersonation. Y'all calm down. But it's so... It just feels weird and icky because these artists, I understand when we lose them soon, we lose them too soon. We wish they were here to kind of experience life with us because they're, you know, we, it's part of standom. Like these artists, we've never met them, but they're part of our lives. We grew up with them. We feel like we know them. So we don't want them to go away. But sometimes you need to just let them go. Just like let them go. Stop bringing them back. And it just feels like we're kind of dragging a corpse around instead of letting the man rest in peace he is giving us classic out the classic out the classic you want to hear it go listen to it it's just weird i don't want to see somebody's ghosts moonwalking on stage <laughs> well and i was talking to a co-worker recently and uh i think the rolling stones or one of those rock bands are coming to vancouver for a tour and my coworker is in her late 50s, I believe. So I asked, are you going to go watch them? That's your generation. And her response was, why would I want to watch a bunch of old people on stage? I, I, I would have watched them when they were young, not when they were old. And they got me thinking, Ed, some of our R&B acts, they're not exactly young anymore. Should we just be watching the young people? Oh, my God. That is so whack to me. Again, I never understood this mentality. And I know it's just because hip-hop, and to an extent R&B, have always been geared toward a younger audiences. But, Playa, these artists, like, we just had this conversation about, you know, the tanks of the world has given us so much hits and whatever. Like, that should be revered. And if they want to come back and give us some stuff, some new stuff, if they want to get out there in their 50s and do some old dance moves, let them do it. They earn that right. It's cool. Now, if you're out here looking crazy, I'm going to tell you you're looking crazy. But I'm not going to say that you can't do it. Let them flourish. So there's that. Now, um, speaking of hating and criticism on social media, our boy John Betts called out Jagged Edge on social Uh-oh. media. I saw uh, this so, one. Yeah, so Tom posted on our Instagram, just shouting out 112 and Jagged Edge for last year, coming together for the, the tour, uh, for a tour where they were singing each other's songs. It was quite an experience, actually. I think a lot of fans were happy with that. And John Betts made a quick remark saying, this is when, or before Jagged Edge started auto-tuning on everything. And uh, I think it was Brian, I think it was Brian from Jagged Edge that commented and said, um, you know, we've been singing without auto-tune for the last seven albums. If we want to be creative, let us be creative. Just enjoy the music. And he pretty much just called John a hater. So, again, we can't, if we're going to go into the mindset that we can't criticize the creator and we just have to enjoy what they're putting out, then that's that. But, I mean, we've had our thoughts about the Layover album and some of their most recent stuff. Should we just let them be creative? That's trash. I'm sorry to tell you, it's trash. It's, I mean, I just went on this long spiel about the the overuse of the word hating. Because hating, in that sense, is basically... I don't like this direction you went. That's an opinion. That's not hating. Like, whatever. Like, this... John is somebody who is a knowledgeable R&B fan who listens to this podcast who, again, wants J.E. to do better. I guarantee you he's a fan of their earlier hits. I guarantee you he wants them to do better. And I'm not mad at Jay. If they want to try doing auto-tune, you can try it. But if it doesn't work, you are not... Your fans are not obligated to love it Because it didn't work. That is complete trash. I saw the exchange because I saw it like right after the tank stuff. And I'm like, everybody just lost their mind. It was the same day. It was like within an hour of each other. And I'm so annoyed by this mindset. If y'all take nothing away from this episode but this. You as a fan, you are free to like what you want to like. If you don't like it, don't let these artists bully you into saying, well, you should like it. Because I gave you a song 20 years ago that you liked. That's trash. If you like something, you like it. If you don't, you don't. That's your opinion. That's it. So there's that. But let's talk about Jagged Edge for a second, Ed. Um, We got into an interesting conversation about this. 
because they have been one of the more progressive groups for R&B over the last two decades. Debut came out in 98. They found some huge success in the early 2000s, and they, they've been one of the only groups that have really stayed together throughout the course of their career. I spoke to B. Cox, and he feels like Jagged Edge doesn't get their props, which I think I can agree with because they do have some hits on their catalog. But mm-hmm. when I we agree. look at it, and when, when we look at the grand scheme of things, would you consider them a 90s group or a 2000s group? Because there's a lot of people, and I've seen on social media that have asked, why isn't Jagged Edge on the Millennium Tour? So it's interesting. It's a very fine line, and it goes back to kind of my hesitation to put labels on artists. You and Tom and and I have had like conversations about this. We talked about it in the cipher as well. I think the confusion comes down with people having different perceptions of what these labels mean. For me, when I hear that so and so is a '90s artist, to me that means that pretty much the entirety of their run or at least the high points of their run, were confined to one decade. So if you told me that Jodeci was a 90s artist, or a 90s artist, I would be like, yes. All their hits came out in the 90s. All their biggest stuff was the 90s. They had their biggest run in the 90s. I can feel you on that. However, sometimes people see it as when you debut. So if you debut in the 90s, like a Mariah Carey, but have a career that has spanned decades and decades and decades, to me, calling her a 90s artist is ridiculous because she's bigger than the 90s. But for some fans, that's when she came of age. So she's a 90s artist. So number one, it's hard to have these conversations because people have different connotations of what that word means. But for me, just personally speaking, when I hear that term, I kind of just judge it as when your peak was, not when you debuted. I mentioned Anthony Hamilton. His debut came out in 96. Nobody remembers that album but me. But people remember Charlene. That was 2003, coming from where I'm from. So most people would say that he's a 2000s artist. Because that's when he was big. Not 96, when no one knew him. So to me, Jagged Edge is very, very hard to rank. Because again, these arbitrary rules. They dropped in 98. They made their name in 98, had hits in 98, but most of their hits were early 2000s. 2000, 2001, going into 2003, they even had a couple joints. So, like, it's really hard to put them in either or. To me, I would consider them 2000s artists, but 90s artists worked pretty well, it's not especially when you consider their style, who they came up with at the time. It's just hard. It's really hard to box in these artists when time doesn't work in a neat way that our little Twitter hashtags want them to work. Yeah, because I think it would be easy to call them a 2000s act if you ignore the fact that I Gotta Be was such a huge hit in 98 because that record was huge. Mm -hmm. And people love that. And that's definitely a 90s record. Uh, Brandon from Jagged Edge chimed in and said that, you know, they, they have the feeling from the 90s but with a twist from the millennium. So I guess they consider themselves a hybrid. And I think you're right. When you get to a certain status, it's kind of hard to put people in a box. Like, would you consider 112 a 90s act? That's another hard one. Like, uh, now they did have a little bit of a headway before JE, so they feel more 90s, especially because in 2000s, they had that big drop-off. I mean, they did have... You know, the um, part three album was 2001, so that was early on. So they feel a little bit more 90s. But again, it's just really, really hard when you cross generate. I mean, cross decades. And for real, that's what you want. Again, I mentioned, I can't remember who said it on the Solo Stereo Cypher. Shout them out. I'm going to shout out whoever it is. I can't remember who it is because I can't say I came up with this, but it was brilliant. This person said that when you look at, a lot of these days, we want to call everybody a legend, and everybody's this and everybody's that. A real legend is someone who has spanned more than one decade. So these artists we're talking about that has been in like 90s, 2000s, 2010s, we're talking Mariah, we're talking Usher and folks like that. If they can do that, that's a legend. You don't have to be all figuring out and like, oh, I like this song, I like that song. But if you look at their success and it has crossed multiple decades, I'm not talking about they were hot in 99 and 2000 and that's it. Like, that don't count. If they were hot for 
through decades, through the music changing through those decades, that's the making of a legend. And I'm like, man, that's a really good measure right there before you start calling somebody a legend. Let me see them have hits in the 90s and the 2000s and the 2010s. You can do that, you might be on to something. Yeah, I 100% agree, but you know, back to 112, it's just like them and Jagged Edge and Drew Hill and Next, they were competitors of one another, so it'd be kind of weird to call one of them a 90s act and the other one a 2000s, because if you remember the 2000s, that was more of that like 106 and Park era with the B2Ks, the uh, the, the Pretty Rickies, Day 26s, it was like a different style of music, so putting yeah, Jagged Edge and with I think- them is kind of weird. And that's why, again, this is confusing because when you think about it, you think about styles and sounds. When you think of 2000s, there's a certain sound that hits in your ear. You're thinking of B2K in them or even like Mario and and Neo. Like there's a certain style that fits that decade. I was talking on another podcast um, about pretty recently about how I feel like the audience changes over every 10 years. So every 10 years, you get a whole new sound. It comes with it. But the thing is, time worked the way time works. It's not like at 2000, everybody from 99 just dies and you never hear from them again. They're still there. They're still doing their thing. And the sounds cross over and it takes a while before the new sound kind of takes off. So that's why you have these JEs and 112s and Nex who were still doing their thing in early 2000, 2001, 2002. But then you slowly hear hear the sound kind of change. And J.E., of all those groups you mentioned, I feel like it's probably the hardest one to put in the box. 112, I would kind of say 90s. Next, I would kind of say 90s. J.E. just is like really on the borderline because they just had so many hits well into that next decade, really outlasting some of their peers. They got a later start, but still. But And the the other thing, I think J.E. sound, it was kind of like ahead of its time in that it worked in the 90s, but it pretty much defined the 2000s with B. Cox and Jermaine Dupri. That was like yep. the early precursor to like the Mariah records, the Usher records, and the Mary records. So it is kind of interesting to look back at Jagged Edge in that sense. Yeah, I think that's why I think B. Cox is right. They're pretty underrated when you look at how they kind of helped pioneer that sound through B. Cox and Dupree and all those that were going to use them on these Mariah records and kind of evolve into the mario and neo sounds a lot of, they really helped that because by mid 2000s we didn't really have 112 anymore or next anymore or any of those other groups Bo- boys and men were long gone well they were around but they were long gone as hit makers so they were the last group standing of the 90s drew hill as we know they had kind of bowed out by then they were the last ones out last men standing and their sound helped create a new sound so for that give them props and I think we got to give them props for this head. Uh, you know, one of the criticisms that come with Jagged Edge is that a lot of their music sounds the same, or at least a lot of the singles do. And, yeah. you know, that some may take that as, you know, well, they aren't really diverse with their music. But, Ed, that formula that they have, it works with Brandon and Brian singing um, the leads. It, it just works. Yeah, if it works, why? If it's one of those things, if it ain't broke, why fix it? There's a time where, you know, if it's. 2005 and you're DMX and you're still barking on every song. It's kind of like, all right, dude, we need something new. That I get. But something about their sound just never really aged to me. And I agree that some of their singles sound similar, especially early on. But there's still some that don't. Like, Where the Party At sound like Where the Party At. They don't sound like anything else. And if you check out their album cuts, they sound distinct. So I think that if you look beyond the big, big songs, because yeah promise and i gotta be like they sound kind of similar i get that let's get married the the slow version yeah that's they all feel like they're cut from the same cloth but overall i think they have the diversity in their catalog so they aren't just kind of like a one note group so to speak so there's that now ed uh this is the play of please for today but this might also be a discussion on social media, if you want. Oh, boy. Uh, the play of please for this week, Ed, is Usher performed a clip of his new song uh, entitled Trust, also known as Confessions 3. And he was singing it. Someone posted it on Instagram with no context, but just the performance with the lyrics. And everyone immediately, including us, jumped 
to him admitting that he had herpes. <laughs> yes, I I heard about this foolishness. I did not know what the deal was. When you actually listen to the song, it's clear that that's not what's going on. But you know, everybody on social media is so quick to like think the worst. Player, calm down. What I am more confused about about this is, I know it's Confessions Part Three, and I know he's still doing the Confessions Part Two album stuff. I don't know. Like, I like that he's kind of going in that vibe, but I wouldn't call it Confessions again. I feel like. And I haven't been very vocal about this. I don't think that it does him any favors to reminisce too hard on the Confessions past. Because it just puts up unrealistic expectations. If he calls his Confessions 3, then you're going to have like the post ranking, let's rank the Confession songs. And it's going to be hard to clear that bar of Part 2 and Part 1. I still think Part 1 is one of the most underrated songs ever. But, you know, let it be its own thing and be in its own vibe. And it can kind of harken back to it. But when everything is a part two and a part three, it just sets unrealistic expectations. Y'all do you and have fun. But I just, again, want this album to kind of thrive. And I don't want it to be hammered with things where like, well, it ain't better than the last one. Well, it's going to be hard to beat the last one. Well, Ed, do you remember the uh, Confessions Part 2 remix with Shine and he was rapping from prison? That was kind of cool. Oh, I re- Oh, that was not cool at all. He was whispering into a phone so he wouldn't get in trouble. I couldn't hear what he was saying. So, uh, Confessions 2, the album coming soon, I believe. I think he's starting to ramp up promo on that. I, he's hosting the iHeartRadio Awards, and I think he's performing there. Strangely enough, he still hasn't performed a single with LMA at all. That's very weird. I wonder what's going on with that. I don't know if he lost confidence in that or what, but... We talked about it here on the podcast before. It is very odd that we were all excited about that song. I know you were losing your mind over that song. But it's just kind of like, eh, kind of. And I don't know if it's still doing well on the charts. I heard it on the radio a couple times, and I don't even listen to the radio. So I know it was around, but the buzz quickly died down, and he didn't really do much to keep it going. Odd. So there's that. And then the other player, please, Ed, here, Justin Bieber. We love talking about Aaron Bieber. Yeah. He dropped his, mm. his album earlier in the year. It was an R&B-based album, or as he would say. But weirdly enough, Ed, I think he made a mistake going R&B because his tour that he set to go on, which was a stadium tour, a lot of those venues are now being downgraded to arenas just due to the low demand. That's Ed, that's why you never go to R&B. <laughs> because we'll stab you in the back and not go to your tours. No, people aren't going to the tour because that album was not good. There was all this hype about it. They had, I told you, they had Megan the Stallion and her friends in booty shorts stirring up their breakfast in the kitchen while they were playing Yummy in the background. I don't know how much that cost y'all, but you need to get your money back because clearly that didn't work. The album just wasn't good. We can make all the excuses if you want. But the album won't good. And Bieber, the Twitter is E.T. Bowser, not Y-K-I-G-S. So don't come for them when you get mad at them. I said your album was not very good. So there's that, Ed. And then speaking of Megan Thee Stallion, of course, she had some contract issues going on. And Twitter Ooh, has decided Lord. that <laughs> Twitter has decided that they are experts at the law and the music industry and we're not going to get into that but i did see a funny tweet from somebody that said that rock nation shout out to rock nation we love you guys but rock nation is equivalent to like wcw back in the early 2000s where they were just pawning <laughs> all the talent that they could <laughs> basically i it's like every album that i review lately i always especially a hip-hop album i always go check out you know the label the producers every album is everybody signed to rock nation like everybody like, everybody's getting a job. I might be signed to Rock Nation and not know it. So, there's that, Ed. Uh, can we get into the soul backtrack of the day here? Yes, let's do it. Well, Tony Braxton is set to announce um, a new single. It's set to come out next month, I believe. She's shooting a video for it right now. And she's she pretty much just said, I got to get skinny before that video shoot but we'll make it happen so new tony braxton <laughs> on the way i think tony braxton's always been sing, uh been skinny but you know 
Oh, um, I know, but I can understand how Twitter is. If you go and you have a little bit, if you, a little bit like an actual human, they will drag you. So I can understand her being extra careful. Um, we're gonna go with the record here by Tony Braxton. Can we go with "Just Be a Man About It" with Dr. Dre? Yes, yes. Because that love it. that that to me is kind of an underrated record. Beacox produced it. Jonte wrote it. It's probably not one of the most notable in. Tony's discography, it definitely didn't do as well as um he wasn't man enough for me, but I feel like this is one of those underrated Tony records. I love it. It's so hilarious to me. Like when they're whispering on the phone in the rain and the <laughs> that there's something about her delivery in the in the hook when she's like, Baby, you don't have to lie to me. Does she sound like <laughs> Barry White's sister or something? It is hilarious. It's one of my favorite Tony songs, to be honest. It's definitely, I don't know if it's unintentionally funny, but something about that video always used to crack me up. I love that song. I'm going to rock it after we get off of here. Indeed. And then the best line in that song, and I think a lot of people can relate to it, she said something along the lines of, uh, since your mama knows it all, that's where you need to be. Yep. Oh, that song is so hood. I love it. Yeah. So, Ed, what's going on with SoInStereo.com? Well, we got a lot going on that doesn't involve Tank, and you will be happy to know that if you haven't checked up on this week's uh, new albums, your boy got plenty of reviews. We talked about Megan D. Stallion. I've got a review of her new EP, LP, playlist, whatever you want to call it. Sugar, I got that. Check that out. As well as a review of the new album from Jada Kiss, Ignatius. I've been waiting for this one. And the reviews have been pretty mixed, and when you listen to the album, you understand why. Because he's taking a different approach. I think it works, though. So check out a review of that. As well as, Tom isn't here, but in spirit, he's over on Soul and Stereo. Because he's the next person to go head-to-head with yours truly. And we debate Music Soul Child. We talk about his best albums, best singles, best video. We also ask the question, is his debut a classic? So if you want to know what the deal is with that, go see Head to Head over on SoulandStereo.com. And this coming week, we've got some pretty good surprises coming as well. Won't spoil that, but we'll talk about it next week. Nice. Um, over at You Know I Got Soul, most recently interviewed Jazz. He wanted to clear the air on the unsung. Didn't really give us too much, but he did announce that he's going to be dropping some of those unreleased records from his solo album that was supposed to come out in the early 2000s before the third Drew album. So that'll be exciting. Um, got a couple of interviews lined up. Still working on Rich Harrison. I know that's one that I've been talking about for the last three months. Um, He's just been MIA, but he he, he pops up every now and then. So we're trying to work that out. And uh, yeah, we're going to just keep doing these interviews. Uh, We're going to probably talk less about Tank. I just mentioned him again. But (laughs) less Tank and more R&B that we can talk about. I know JoJo's putting out a new single soon, so we'll talk about that. But Ed, I think that's it for this week. I guess that's it for this week. And now that Tank is Voldemort and we can no longer talk about him, that's fine with me. But again, my parting words is, like who you like. And don't let these artists bully you, whether it's Tank or J.E., into telling you what you shouldn't like and what you should like. You are a fan. You support these artists. You put money into it. You spoof spins. If you're listening to this podcast, you're clearly a super fan. So you have every right to express your opinion. That's what it's all about. That is true. And oh, uh, and then the last feature I forgot to mention, Tom's been doing this. He's been DMing artists, asking them from their discography what are five songs that they wish were demos, or not demos, singles. Um, And we got a response back from Nokio, so he gave us his list. And this is not a song track of the day, but Men Men Always Regret. Remember that song by Drew? That's a dope record. I do. And yeah, and I really like that post, and um, I forgot to shout out Tom. I thought it was a really good post. One of kind of like a soul and stereo inspired type joint. And Nokio shouted out "If I Could" from the Drew World Order album, which I love, and also thought it was a single. So when Nokio just approved what I've been saying for years, I felt justified. "If I Could" should have been a single. Love that song. It should be an A R N R. It should be an A N R at Rock Nation. Well, I might already be and not be getting. I might be on that Megan the Stallion <laughs> on that. I got that contract where I'm doing work and not getting paid for it. <laughs> I don't think you want to be 
uh, having your credits on that album, though. So, no, absolutely not. Go check my review, and you can see why. <laughs> All right, and I think that's it for this week, guys. We'll be back next week, hopefully, with Tom, and we'll talk more good R and B, and we won't talk any bad R and B. I'm out. Yeah, I know, I know. He who shall not be named, be named, be named, be named, be named.